Good morning. How are we doing? It's great to be here, and it is certainly an honor to be at Southwestern. I want to thank Dr. Aiken for the kind, or South, where am I? Southeastern. I said Southeastern, right? I'm sorry. Sorry. Let's do that over again. I'll get back, and then we'll come back. Southeastern. <laughs> Beautiful place, and it is a great, great day to be here. I'm grateful for Dr. Aiken, and in all sincerity, uh, just as a pastor who's maybe just a little bit older than most of you in the room, I, um, I'm excited and expectant for you. I, I look out and I see the future of who we are as the followers of Jesus, you know, like future theologians, future pastors, future missionaries, future leaders, future um, the future's in this room, and so we're excited for you. We're expecting high things from you, and if we at Johnson Ferry can be of any help to you in any way in your ministry journey, uh, we would love to do that. But it's my privilege today here at Southeastern to preach the Word of God, and so I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I teach out of the New American Standard, so that may sound a little different than what you typically read from, or if you have a device, you can just switch it over to the New American Standard. But we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. What price are you willing to pay to have true Christian community? What price are you willing to pay to have true Christian community? community? That question is at the heart of what is addressed in 1 Corinthians 8. And though the argument covers chapter 8 all the way through chapter 10, today we'll just look at the first part in chapter 8. We want to look at an issue that the church in Corinth was dealing with that at its core has to do with the price tag of Christian community. Now, you're seminary students, so I'll make some massive assumptions that you know some basic biblical backgrounds, but Corinthians, or Corinth, was certainly a strategic isthmus there in the Roman world. It was a combination of Wall Street, where people went to make money, with Las Vegas, where people went to have a good time. And it was a strategic place, a modern city, a religious city filled with temples, and what a perfect place for the Apostle Paul to plant a church. And yet, because this church was so steeped in pagan roots, at least that was true of most of its followers, they brought into them, into the church with them, a, a, a litany of habits and behaviors and things that would have been familiar to them in their pre-Jesus days. And so we're eavesdropping in 1 Corinthians on a conversation between the Apostle Paul and this church, dealing with a number of different issues that at their core had to do with what does it look like for the gospel of Jesus to change us not only for our eternal salvation, but also as a gospel-driven community. So what is the price that they, and what is the price that we are willing to pay to have that community? So we're just going to dive right into the text. If you would, look at the first part of verse 1 in chapter 8. Paul begins this section by saying, Now concerning food sacrificed, to idols. It might more literally be read idol offerings. See, in the city of Corinth, there were a number of different gods that people would go to temples to worship, whether it was Zeus, the king of all the gods, or Apollo, or Athena, or whatever god you pick to help you with whatever predicament you were in. They would go to temples and they would sacrifice to these gods. They would often bring animal sacrifices of meat. And so a, a pagan priest would then offer this meat to the idol, to the god, and he would take some for his own benefit. He would give some for the temple. And what whatever was left over was either sold or could be eaten at the temple. And so the issue is, as followers of Jesus, can we eat that meat? Can we go to the temple and eat and what was a normal thing to do in Corinth, or should we refrain from eating the meat? That is the issue that Paul is dealing with. And now, if you've been a follower of Jesus, you're a mature follower, you're thinking, big deal, it's just meat. I mean, who doesn't love a good steak? This is the day before there was a Publix on every corner. This is the day before Harris Teeter was right down the street. You, you could just, so you had to go to the temple if you want to get a good piece of meat. Why not? Big deal. 
It's just a piece of meat. But if you're a recent convert, if you're new to the faith, you come in with a list of just emotions that surround this behavior. I mean, this is the behavior that you've come from, that you've walked out of, and you, and you don't know how to articulate it, but just something, it just, it feels wrong about participating in a lifestyle that I am trying to get away from now that I have found Jesus. So how does this group of mature followers of Jesus and this group of new, maybe vulnerable followers of Jesus, how do, how do they come together in Christian community? Paul is going to unpack that in these 13 verses that we'll look at in a subject that I've just called responsible freedom. Responsible freedom. I, I came up with just a brief little matrix to get at this idea of what I mean by responsible freedom. And if you look at this diagram, you can see that, you know, in one corner we have a life with no responsibility, no freedom. And no one likes that. That's a life of, of being in prison. No one gives you anything responsible. No one gives you any freedom. No one wants a life like that. Maybe you're a person that you say, I, I, like, I like responsibility but not freedom. And I guess that's probably not true for most of you. People quit jobs over that. A job where you're just given tasks to do, responsibilities to do, but you have no freedom, no autonomy to set your schedule now, on the other corner, you have a life with no responsibility and lots of freedom. This is the life that my 15-year-old daughter is craving to have. Dad, I want money. Dad, I want to stay out as long as I can. Dad, I want a new phone. Dad, I want tons of freedom, but I don't want to do chores. I don't want to do responsible things. And that's the life of an adolescent. But what does it look like to have both responsibility and yet also freedom. That's grace for grown-ups. That's what we as mature followers of Jesus are to embody in our churches. So if we had someone ask us, can I eat this meat? Here's the question. What would you tell them to do? What would you tell them to do? Now you might be thinking, why in the world are we talking about meat sacrifice to idols. I mean, is that an issue here at Southeastern that we're unaware of? Are people struggling with that today? Well, I think there's actually a relevance to this issue beyond simply just the exact nature of meat sacrifice to idols. And I think it's something that we all struggle with in the Christian life, particularly as we try to put mature believers with new believers together in this new gospel community made up of different backgrounds and ethnicities and experiences, yet all coming to the foot of the cross together. And yet there's conflict. So if, if, if you're a, uh, a mature believer, you think, what's the big deal? It's just meat. I mean, aren't you glad we live in the new covenant, by the way, where we can eat anything we want, according to the Lord? Isn't that good news? I mean, you can eat as much bacon as you want in the new covenant. Thank you, Jesus, for that. God's great miracle, pigs eat anything, trash, and out comes bacon. It is a miracle every time it happens. And we can eat that all because of the shed blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. <laughs> but you have these vulnerable Christians who are new to the faith, and they're asking all these questions. And I have them in my church, but you have them in your church as well, and I love them. I, I love being around new believers who have that infectious joy of recently discovering the gospel of Jesus and having their lives change. I love it. I mean, I have a, a friend at our church who became a believer in the last year and a half. And I love the first couple Sundays I would see him after a sermon. He goes, Clay, that was a hell of a sermon. I love that. I thought, you know, I love that. I love that infectious joy, you know, of a, new, of a new believer. But he would ask questions that are the kind of questions that lots of new believers ask. You know, now that I've found Jesus, um, can I still listen to the same music I was listening to? Or they might ask, do I still date this person? Or do I need to get rid of that person in my life? I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, but my spouse is not a Christian. Do I need to get a divorce from them? Can I, can I get a tattoo? Can I, assuming it's legal, and can I drink? Can I, can, I do, can I partake in things? Can I watch this show? Can I go to this place? I mean, these are, these are questions that people in your churches ask all the time. And the questions that those of us who are mature should be asking is, am I setting the example for those who are seeking to follow Jesus. So don't think this is some arcane, historic, pre-enlightened issue that we have grown past in our day. We are dealing with the same thing. 
So the question is, if someone came up to you and said, should I eat this meat, what would you tell them to do? Now, Paul will get to an answer here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but in our time of Bible study, I want us to explore his answer in a set of questions. I want us to look at this text, ask a few questions of this text, and then ask ourselves an important question at the end that evaluates our own response to similar situations. So we're going to look today at five questions of this text starting in verses 1 through 3. And here's the first question I want us to ask together. What is the relationship between knowledge and love? Knowledge and love. Let's go back to our text, verses 1 through 3. Now, concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes one conceited, but love edifies people. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So whatever the answer is, it must have to do with this relationship between knowledge and love. Now, many scholars think that in verse 1, where it starts, we know that we all have knowledge. Many scholars think that that was a quote that Corinthian believers wrote to Paul and he's responding to. So that's not necessarily Paul saying it, but he's saying, okay, this is your statement, that we all have knowledge. And that's what they were basing their decision upon. What was that knowledge? The Greek simply uses the word for knowledge, gnosis. It could mean a couple things. Is knowledge here a well-rounded theology, a well-rounded doctrine? Facts they know about Jesus and the new covenant and what we can and can't eat, perhaps? Although if you read through 1 Corinthians, you see that one of the major issues that caused rivalry in the church was their use and abuse of spiritual gifts, which is why many scholars think that what he's dealing with here is maybe a gift of knowledge, both in 1 Corinthians 1 and 1 Corinthians 10, uh, excuse me, 12, it talks about a, a word of knowledge, maybe a gift of knowledge, which some would interpret as meaning uh, the spiritual ability to to apply God's word in a particular way for a particular congregation. But regardless of whether we're just talking about facts one knows or some kind of spiritual gifting one has, they were basing their decision to just go and eat the steak on knowledge. But Paul zooms out to a larger principle, not to say that knowledge is wrong, knowledge is given by the Lord. But he says, let's just be honest, knowledge makes one conceited, but love edifies people. Knowledge can make one conceited. I'm going to assume, speaking here in an academic institution, that you understand and perhaps even see at times how knowledge can make people conceited. I remember doing my uh, Master of Divinity and sitting in a particular class. I did not grow up wanting to go into the ministry. I did not take any kind of Bible class prior to seminary, so it was all new to me, and I was soaking it up, and I loved it. Seminary was very formative for me, yet there were some uh, men in particular who maybe grew up going to a Bible college, or they had had all this stuff before, and I would watch, you know, 23-year-olds argue with professors about things they knew, and, and I don't know what the professor was thinking, but I bet he was thinking, I'd love to punch that kid in the face, right? And it's because knowledge, if, if, not, if not curtailed knowledge, makes you conceit. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies people. So regardless of whatever Paul says about the meat, just realize something he's saying here, that love actually trumps your freedom. Sometimes being right is actually wrong. And he goes on to verse 3 and says, if anyone loves God, excuse me, verse 2, if anyone thinks he, has, he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. What Paul is saying here is that love is actually the greater indicator of spiritual maturity. The ability to know God's love, to be known by God, and to appropriate that love to others. So it's not just what you know, but it's who you know, and more importantly, in the gospel, who knows you. Amen. So love and knowledge, knowledge and love. Love trumps knowledge. And we struggle with that. There was a commercial a couple years ago I, I loved. It was a Geico commercial, and it said something like, can Geico save you 10%? 
was Abe Lincoln always honest? And do you remember this conversation, this, this uh, commercial it had Mrs. Lincoln and she's trying on a dress and Abe Lincoln's behind her and she goes, Abe, does this dress make me look large in the back? And you see him struggling, mm, well, mm. And he says, well, perhaps, you know, and then, and she walks off, you know, she storms off mad. So even, even honest Abe struggled to know that there is a difference between honesty and love. And what we have in our churches a lot today is we have bobbleheads. People with big heads and small hearts. Knowledge is important, but not if knowledge is destroying your fellow believer. Love edifies, knowledge puffs up. So that's the first question, what's the relationship between knowledge and love? Second question, drilling into this issue, what are idols and what do we do with them? What are idols and what do we do with them? Now Paul here, in verses 4 through 6, agrees with those making the statement that idols are nothing. If you look in verse 4 through 6, he says, Therefore, concerning the eating of food, sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God. God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Again, some think that there is yet another quote here that was given that Paul was responding to. The quote perhaps is the phrase, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. And Paul is agreeing with that truth. He's agreeing that idols are false gods. Now, we in our particularly American context, post-enlightened context, we, we don't have idols in the way the ancient world did, though some of the places that you will go and serve and share the gospel with in unreached peoples, in this day and age, they still have idols. But most of us, I'm going to make the assumption, don't struggle with idol worship in the way perhaps the Corinth, Corinth church did. I'm going to guess if I came to your apartment, your dorm, there's probably not some little statue in your closet somewhere that you bow down to to make sure you get a good grade on the next test. If so, we probably need to talk after the chapel. But let's be honest, though idols are false gods, there are idols. We all struggle with idols. Paul says that greed is idolatry. Maybe power is an idol. Sex, beauty, ambition. And idols, anything other than God that we allow to exalt us or to condemn us. So idols are a real thing. And Paul, while acknowledging that idols are a real thing, also acknowledges that the idols that the Corinthian church was worshiping falsely, or at least the lifestyle that they had come out to, they were false gods. He says there is one God, and I love this declaration of his monotheistic uh, doxology here in verse 6. Yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom we are, are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. I love that the God we serve, one being in three persons, the Father, for whom are all things, the Son, through whom are all things, the Spirit, by whom are all things, and we can rest in the gospel. So you might assume at this point, Paul is saying, go ahead and eat it. There's only one God. The gods that they worship are false gods. It's just a steak. Big deal. Eat the meat. And if we stopped here, perhaps that would be the conclusion. But he doesn't. Which gets us to our third question. What role does the conscience play in decision-making? What role does the conscience play in decision-making? You see, in verses 7 through 12, Paul will rely heavily upon this word conscience. Uh, conscience. It's a word that's used throughout the whole Pauline corpus. Uh, suna desis, you know, soon, with, uh, ido, to know. It's, it's, a, it's a knowing with it's this idea of, of knowledge with. And, and the word conscience is used in different ways in the New Testament. 
Perhaps three images will help recall the different ways that it's used. Sometimes the conscience is used like a stop sign. I'm going in this direction. My conscience tells me that this behavior is wrong. I need to stop doing what I'm doing. That's how we often talk about conscience. Sometimes we talk about conscience in the way of a compass. Do I take this path or do I take this path? Do I take this job? Do I take this job? Do I, do I go here? Do I go here? And we talk about letting your conscience lead you in that way. But perhaps the way Paul is using it in this text is actually more like a third image, and that is of a mirror. When I look at myself in the mirror and I see myself, am I proud of what I see or am I not? I think that's what Paul is getting here. Is, is what I see in myself something that, that, that fills me up that makes me proud, that gives me confidence? Or do I look at myself and I'm deflated? I think I'm less than I should be. That's what Paul is getting at here in this text. And so let's look at this together. He he says to them in verse 7, However, not all people have this knowledge. But some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Perhaps we could interject an English word onto that. Their confidence being weak is defiled. Remember, what did they say? We could all eat the meat because we all have knowledge. And Paul says, actually, not all of you in the church have this knowledge because some are struggling with this decision. In verse 8, He says, now food will not bring us close to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. Again, Paul just making big principles here that, let's be honest, food, I understand it doesn't make us closer to God. Food doesn't pull us away from God. It's not like if I eat this, I'm somehow closer to God. Or if I don't eat this, I'm not closer to God. Eating one way is not more ethical. Eating another way is not more unethical. Well, I'll take that back. I will say, for people who are vegetarians, now vegetarians... I mean, I love vegetables, right? But you got to think, it's a little unethical to base your whole diet on something that can't also run for its life. I mean, have you ever thought about this? Amen. (laughs) But what Paul is saying, look, what goes into our stomach doesn't make us closer or farther away from God. So the issue is not so much what constitutes a steak. The issue is how the person sees themselves when they eat the steak. Look in verse 9 and 10. But take care that this freedom of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will his conscience, if he is weak, not be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? There's a word play here. Paul is contrasting stumbling with strengthening. To, to stumble literally means to put something in someone's path that would make them trip. The opposite is what he means by the word strengthening, which literally means to make one stand. So now we're getting at the issue. Okay, the issue is not just the steak. The issue is that my eating of the steak or not eating it is going to have two ramifications. It might make someone stumble instead of making them stand. The reason to eat the meat or not to eat is not merely just a matter of offending somebody. It's something deeper. I love what Gordon Fee says, these actions do not have to do with offending someone, but with causing people to fall by urging on them an action they cannot do freely. So you're there with your friends at the temple. After all, they serve some of the best food in town. It's Corinth, it's a beautiful day. You're sitting there, three or four of you, breeze in your face, got your sunglasses on, you're eating the best meal you've had in, in a long time. And you look out the corner of your eye, and there's, there's Lydia. You know Lydia, the 
The, the woman who recently came to Christ was amazing. Her testimony came out of all that paganism, found the grace of Jesus, the grace of God. I mean, and can it be, right? Her chains fell off. Her heart was free. She rose, went forth. She followed. It was amazing. Remember that testimony at church? It was amazing. And you say, Lydia, come on, Ellie, come eat with us. Come eat with us. And she sits down. And, of course, it's family style. So you pull up a plate because you're being hospitable. Maybe you have the gift of hospitality and you're spooning her the meat that you got. And we're just enjoying this wonderful fellowship of the saints on this beautiful day in Corinth. But Lydia is bothered. She would never say it. I mean, there's four of you, like she's going to make a scene. And she doesn't want to be seen as the outcast. But every bite she takes of that steak, it does something to the way she sees herself. She feels like she's compromising. True or not, she feels like the commitment she made to take up her cross and follow Jesus, even when her family would deny her, it seems like she's selling out. Paul says, here's what's happening in this moment. Verse 11. For, though, for through your knowledge, the one who is weak is ruined. The brother or sister for whose sake Christ died. Think about how stark that is. The, the word for ruin, apolumi, it's the same word that's in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not apolumi, would not be destroyed, would not perish. Now, I'm not saying that you eating the steak is going to make her lose her salvation, but in some way, the action that you thought was not a big deal is crushing her, ruining her conscience to the level that in verse 12 he says, and so by sinning against the brothers and sisters and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Is that not a haunting passage? We often stand on our freedom. I can do this. Who cares? But what if your action is not only sinning against your brother and sister, but you're actually sinning against Christ? Question number four. What was Paul's solution? In verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, if, any, if, if food causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to sin. The word uh, to sin, scandalon, scandal. The cross is also called a scandal. If, if, if my eating causes this scandal, this brother to sin, I will never eat meat again. And one thing we have to notice about the Apostle Paul is though he had freedom, he often gave up his freedom for the cause of his brother and sister and for the cause of the Great Commission. If we had time and we looked at the entire argument that goes all the way through chapter 10, we would... Note a couple verses, and I'll just highlight a few. Chapter 9, verse 19, Paul says, For though I am free from all people, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might gain more. In chapter 10, verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, No one is to seek his own advantage, but rather that of his neighbor. And of course, in chapter 31, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. Interesting that the context of that verse that we talk about so much is about someone giving up something that they are allowed to do, because by giving it up, we might therefore glorify God. Now, I guess you could take this teaching and maybe take it somewhere it doesn't go through the entire of the New Testament. I don't think Paul is saying here that if anything you do at any time offends anybody, then just never do it. Because when you look at the arguments of Romans 14 and 15, he's talking about people with a more legalistic bent that were trying to bind the conscience of others by their legalistic behavior, and Paul would not go there with them, encouraging them rather to be strong instead of weak. 
But here to the vulnerable believer, the one who's doubting, the one who's just barely a Christian, the one who's new to all this, who's coming out of this pagan lifestyle, Paul is accommodating himself so that they would be received as a follow, as a fellow brother and sister in Christ. I texted a good friend of mine uh, who's on your faculty, Dr. Stephen Wade, and told him that I was going to be teaching today about meat sacrifice to idols. And he asked, why are you teaching about that? I said, well, I know that's a particular struggle here at Southeastern, you know. And you may think, honestly, what does this have to do with my life? Well, maybe we'll just wrap it up with this fifth and final question. Am I pulling people towards Jesus or am I pushing them away? That's at the heart of this text. Not just meat sacrificed to idols, but when you think about the way you live, when you think about the places you go, when you think about the food you drink, when you, the food you eat, the drinks that you drink, when you think about how you spend your time online, when you think about the things that you tweet and retweet and repost and scroll through on TikTok, when you think about the whole behavior of your life, are you pulling people towards Jesus or are you pushing them away? One of my favorite movies when I was a kid was Jurassic Park. Anybody remember Jurassic Park? It's an awesome movie. Dinosaurs eat people everywhere. It's great. And, of course, the whole movie is predicated upon the fact that these scientists have figured out how to clone these dinosaurs. And, of course, the monster they created got away from them. And there's a scene where Jeff Goldblum's character, Ian Malcolm, comes in and he rushes in and he makes this profound statement seeing the destruction that these dinosaurs had created. And he said, you were so preoccupied with whether or not you could, you didn't stop to ask if you should. Dr. Harry Ironside, a famous preacher, once told a story of a man in his church who had recently come out of the Muslim faith. And he was attending a church picnic and they were just having a grand old time. And there was a young woman who was passing out sandwiches to everybody. And she got to this new believer in Christ, formerly Muslim, now a follower of Jesus. And uh, he said, what kind of sandwiches do you have? She said, well, we have, we have ham, we have pork. And he says, do you have any beef? And she says, no. He says, well, then I'll just, I just won't eat. Now, she knew him, and she was surprised. I mean, he's now a Christian. And she said, why don't you eat the sandwiches? You're free to eat them now. And Dr. Einstein told about his response to this young woman. He said, well, I am free to eat, and I'm also free not to eat. He says, because every year I travel back to the Middle East to see my family. And I know that when I get to the door of my house, my father is going to ask me one question. Have those infidels taught you to eat the hog's meat yet? He says, if I say yes and admit that I have eaten it, then I will not be given admittance to my home and be banished from my family. But if I can say, no, Father, I have not eaten it, he says, I'll be given admittance to the home and I can speak freely of the grace that has been given to me in Jesus Christ. So, do we eat the meat or not? What would you tell them to do? Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace that's found in, our, in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wisdom that comes by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for how you lead us to love others. I pray that as we think about our life, where we go, what we do, what we say, I pray, Lord, that we would be pulling people towards the gospel, pulling people towards Jesus and not pushing them away. Would our love for one another trump the freedom that we have to do what we want? And we'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.